And things that, that he's doing with us and for us and um, it's part of our, our group um, for a daily basis. Miguel, how long have you been actively coming to the role plays and masterminds? Uh, I want to say January, third week in January I want, uh, is when I started coming on board. On a regular basis. Yeah. So what? Right. What is that? Six, seven months, six and a half months. Yeah, yeah. And um, how many days a week? So it, 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 I think I average about four to f- four days out of the week. Four, sometimes right. five, sometimes four. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we'll talk more about that in just a second. Sure. Miguel uh, comes to us from the San Fernando Valley. So we, if you've got questions, please post them in the chat box. Or uh, we'll have some time at the end to ask questions. Absolutely. It's very exciting uh, that we have this opportunity and we're sharing lots of ideas. As a reminder, if you go to events.c21masters.com, um, that is that the email, the website, uh, Robert? Events.c21masters.com. Yes. Correct. Um, we have about 65 or 70 videos that we have done, they're recorded, they're up there for you to uh, take a look at, see what's going on. So please join us with that. And in a couple of days, we'll have this one posted too. So Miguel, why don't you give me the Reader's Digest version of uh, how you started in the real estate business and the area that you serve and uh, the clientele that you work with? Yeah, that's a great question, Neil. So my father uh, was a real estate agent since he retired still alive and he owns some, you know, owns property here and there. But uh, he actually, I started real estate. If you really want to go back to the day, I might've been 13, 14 year old, years old, passing out flyers in the community of properties he just listed. And I uh, used to stuff envelopes, uh, you know, mailers for him in the summertime. And so I really started at an early age, um, getting exposed to what real estate was all about. So I started right at uh, right out of college. I went to San Diego State, and I want to say that I started in '95 uh, into a real estate business. And how that happened, Neil, is I didn't want anything to do with real estate. Right? You're always trying to one up your old man, and I'm like, well, you know, real estate is is great, and you know, he's made good money, but I want to be a CFO and I want to be the boss. You know, and let, let alone here we are. We are the secretary, the administrative assistant, the sales manager. I mean, we're all in that, right? And so what happened in college, um, I started interning. And interesting enough, I interned at a company that sold stocks. And, you know, and I was hired to look for leads for these, for the officers. Well, in there, in that company, they sold stocks, but they also sold real estate. And they were trying to balance a portfolio there. And so I would call to pick up leads and then they would turn them over to uh, some of the land partnerships that they had, et cetera. And this is kind of where it birthed from in terms of getting on the phones and, and marketing to people and having conversations with folks. It started there and there was always a competition in that room to see who had the better leads and who had the most leads that day. And so you start hearing people speaking and how can I say this better and what should I be saying? And and so that's where that all started, okay? Again, I had no rhyme or reason. I didn't even think I was gonna get into residential. Fast forward, started working for Marcus and Millichap while I was still in college. And uh, that's in a you know, commercial outfit, apartments. And again, you're back on the phones again, et cetera. And uh, shortly about uh, a year after working for them, I ended up moving back to uh, San Fernando Valley, Santa Clarita Valley where I grew up and had a grandfather was passing away. And I said, I was really close to him. I said, gosh, let me just take my business up there and I'll work commercial. Right. And so I found the best company in, or the biggest company in this, in, in our community, which was Remax and uh, interviewed there. And I love the professionalism. And I said, okay, I'm going to work for, for Remax and then uh, do commercial. You know, I've probably done one commercial transaction in my 22 years in the business. You know, oh. it's all been residential since then. Yeah. So everything has is, is turned out to be mostly residential. 
even though you started down the commercial street? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Good for you. Good, good for you. So um, when you started doing deals, I mean, where did the deals start to come from for you? Okay. So I, I've never been to a, a Mike Ferry seminar, but I did go to Johnny Hopkins uh, seminar down in San Diego when I was with Marcus and Millichap, and I really enjoyed going to these seminars. So not really knowing what to do. And my broker said, hey, here's a desk. Here's a phone. Go make some money. Good I luck, did. son. You're on your own. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> and really, you are. I mean, you think about it is, you know, you've got to take action like you were suggesting earlier. You got to take action to, to make things happen. So what I did is I got my I had my yearbooks from from high school. And in high school, I was friends with everybody. I'm, I'm a very amiable person. I like people. And, and so I used to have them sign in the back, you know, hey, Miguel, have a great summer, you know, keep in touch. And they leave their phone number. So I, what I did is I took my sister's yearbook, my two yearbooks, and I went through all those yearbooks and started calling the phone numbers that were on that, on the inside covers. And interesting enough, I ended up, uh, my first transaction was from those phone calls. I got a referral from a, a gal that I went to school with. Her boyfriend was selling. Hey, Miguel, you can't see everybody, but they're all running to go get their kids' yearbooks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that might not be a bad thing. That might not be a bad thing. But here's what's interesting, Neil, because, and we'll probably speak about this a little further, is I... You know, I'm always paying attention to what I'm saying and how I'm saying it. When I started the phone call on my first yearbook phone call, we'll just call it the yearbook phone call. I said, hi, Mrs. Smith. Um, I'm Miguel Solar with Remax Real Estate. I went to school with your daughter. Can I get her number or something in, in something to that respect? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let her know you called. So I switched that and I didn't mention real estate. And then I said, hi, Mrs. Smith. Miguel Solar here. I was away for college four years and I just got back into town. And who doesn't want their daughter to be, you know, have friends that went to college, right? And so I was just wondering if, say, Elizabeth was, uh, you know, how's she doing? Gosh, here, here's her number. Let me give it to you. Okay, great. Got the number. And by the way, Neil um, or Mrs. Smith is I'm in the real estate business now. And is there anything that you need? Right. Okay. That's kind of how that happened. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. So, so how much business? So what year was that? That was 1999. And I started in the summer. Okay. 1999 in the summer. So 21, 22 years ago. Yeah. About 20, 22, you know, got it. So how much business? I mean, you, you did that very, very creative on your part. How much business you did you do your first year? I want to say the first year, I believe I did eight transactions. So eight deals, buyers, sellers, just a little bit of whatever. That was probably a seven, 70% buyers. Okay. And so, you know, six buyers, maybe a few sellers. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. And you, you did that kind of generating a business for how long and, and that kind of levels? Um, I haven't really stopped. I mean, I always do. No, I, I'm, I'm saying what I'm saying is, oh. um, so you did seven deals the first year. The second year, you did the similar kind of generating a business. Did you do seven deals, 10 deals, 14 deals? So I doubled it the following year, and then I doubled it the year after that. So you went from 14, and then you were about the third 25, year into it. You were 25, 28, right? 25, 28 deals. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Again, part buyers, part sellers, mostly buyers. I'd say 60% buyers, maybe 70% buyers. Okay, got it. So we're 2003. Uh, the market's starting to heat up and um, almost anybody can buy a house. That was an interesting market, right? Because... Uh, yeah, everybody bought a house. And if you were a cook at um, Denny's, you owned the restaurant. Right, right. right. <laughs> and uh, it was a very interesting time during that, uh, during that year. So, you know, I've always been on the phone type of guy because in 1999, 
Um, I would, I was going to go to Johnny Hopkins seminar again, but then somebody said, Hey, this Mike Ferry thing. And I said, Hey, I'll go to Mike Ferry. Why not? Cancel Tommy went to Mike. I didn't know. You already, you already heard Tommy. What more has he got to tell you? Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. So now I'll go to Mike. Yeah. And so I went to Mike and then, um, on the fourth day and it was, uh, what was it? It was, uh, what, what, the script class is a product, productivity school. That's what uh-huh. And Matthew was up there and, on the fourth day, uh, this, uh, you might know him, Joe D. We call him Joe D. Uh, real estate guy. From Vegas. Yeah, from Vegas. He, he closed me because I had a fancy or, a, or what I thought was a fancy watch. And I'll never forget it. We're sitting there having lunch and he closed me. He's like, hey, do you like those watches? I said, I do. He's like, do you know how many more you can buy if you just get into a system that helps you generate money? And Love it. signed up on the fourth, on the last day. Uh, of, of uh, that seminar. So it was the best decision I've ever made. Best decision. Got it. So where did your business go from there? So that was in 1999. So I, I really don't know anything besides what Mike's, uh, you know, Mike Ferry's been teaching. Um, that's kind of the only thing I really know, you know. So uh, from there, You know, you start networking with other agents and, you know, you hear about these dialing systems. And and so I ended up getting this thing called a Gemini and and you would need two phone lines. And it was a beautiful thing because it would queue up some calls for you. And then you were just I was just hammering 50, 60 phone calls a day. And knowing what I know now, I wish I had the skill set that I have now back then, because there I don't know how many opportunities were missed back then but long story short i was making the phone calls and then building a database from there got it got it got it so let's fast from so you had the mindset you were consistent you did your job you built your business you were making some money and um, and enjoying life right yep okay so we fast forward we go through what did you get involved in the reo market etc during 2006, seven, or excuse me, uh, seven, eight, or nine, or what happened there? I, I thought I was supposed to do that. And I learned about an event that was occurring over in Dallas, Texas. Yeah, five star. I, what was that? Five star. Yes, the five star. And when I saw the behavior of agents and I saw the be like what you had to try to do. Yeah, I just, I went to that event one time and I said, I was done. I have a decision to make. I'm either going to chase REOs or work my database. And I stuck with my database and, and, and maybe I could have gone to REOs, but I think that would have hurt me today had I done that. You know, I don't know. Who knows? I mean, I can't really predict that, but I, I stuck with the database and, and thrived through that time. Almost every REO guy is is out of the business or on the ropes. Yeah. Uh, that whole REO business killed so many agents. Uh, I wouldn't teach it. Um, and a few agents had left us at the time, but it's, uh, it's, it's, just not a, it's just not a healthy business. And so you made a really smart move, I think, look where you are today. Sure. So congratulations. Thank so you. let's fast forward it, okay? It's uh, 2019. You, uh, but how much business did you do that? So 2019, I was looking at my numbers because I've been with Mike for such a long time, Neil. And what's interesting in 2019, um, in 2000, for, for a long, I just, just go back a decade, right? Cause I have my, my number analyzer here. I've always been a 45, 58 type of guy transaction, transactionally wise. And I've always hovered and, and back, you know, 10 years ago that, you know, 48, 50 deals got you $300,000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good money. Woo. I was making a ton of money, you know, um, half, I think were all my kids born at that time. Well, most of them were born, you know, we, 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 we I didn't really work much weekends and, and I kind of compartmentalized the business into five days. And then fast forward, I had a, a few 700,000 uh, a couple seven hundred thousand dollar years, and then, then this year, last year was over half a million, and then this year we're projected uh, over seven hundred. Right, good for you. So, two thousand nineteen, uh, 
you're you're setting yourself up. You got ready for the goals for 2020, 2020, January and February come. You're cooking away. Business was fairly decent, and then COVID hits March of uh, March of uh, 20. So. What, what happened to your mindset then? I mean, uh, did you just keep rolling? Did it stop you for a second? You know, I want, I'm trying to get into your head a little bit, Miguel. Yeah. Um, I mean, clearly the nervous nervousness set in. And I'll share with you in just a bit of, of how I overcame that. Um, back in 2000, let me rewind for one second. I think that's all tied in. In 2017, I came um, out of what would be one of my better years. It was over 700,000. Uh, close to uh, 58 and probably close and pending. I probably had four or five more in there. And what had happened in that fourth quarter, Neil, is I got way overwhelmed, way emotional. Um, we're closing a ton of transactions and I stopped prospecting that year or, or that fourth quarter. Not completely stop it. I, my mind wasn't there. And what I learned from that is whatever I did in that fourth quarter affected the first quarter of the following year. And because right. I was such a, like, I, I had a, a late start the following year because of what I did in the fourth quarter. So since 17, learning that lesson, my, I made it a priority that my fourth quarter was just very, as disciplined as I could possibly can, right? I mean, we got holidays and Thanksgiving and Christmas and I want to take a day off and I'm hungover, whatever, right? I mean, it's different for everybody. Um, but I made it a point that I was not going to let the brakes off until December, I think it was maybe December 22nd, maybe, and then maybe come back in the office a couple of days after, after the Christmas, right. start January 1st with the bank. So to answer your question, I came into 2020 with a good number of transactions closing because of right. my efforts in, in October, November, December, the, the year before in 2019. So I kind of had that pattern there um, in terms of just having the income. Right now I have a large family and I worry a lot and, you know, I want to make sure I'm providing for them. And, you know, I, I stress out about that and, and we'll talk about that later because there's, there's something in there as well, but COVID hits. And I said, Oh crap, I have a bunch of deals in escrow. Are they going to fall out? I have some listings coming out. What's the deal. And what happened is in my town, there's about 20 of us um, top agents in town. And we've just, you know, Neil Weichel's in there and some of the big, the big hitters here in town. And we just collaborate on Tuesdays and we just share what's coming up and what kind of buyer needs we have. But we started really focusing on how do we get our listings sold during COVID. And if it wasn't for everyone brainstorming and really talking about their, their fears and, and then solutions to that, you know, I, I probably could have lost a, um, two or three months, you know, mentally, you know, right. not, not moving or, or being in action. So we, re, we, we did a resolve around that. And then that kind of got us through showing our listing sign this form. And this is all before the, the PEDs came out, P E A D. Right. Right. So we had our own PED, you know, that probably didn't hold any weight, but we got our property sold. Good. Excellent. So, um, so you got back on track and the rest of the year was pretty powerful. So you, how'd you get uh, hooked up with us? So many years ago, and I don't know if you remember this, uh, there was a guy named Michael um, that I met at a Mike Ferry event. And he says, hey, let's go to this thing called Blitz. I've been going to this thing called Blitz. And I think it was on Tuesdays, maybe over in the Walnut office, something like that. Sure. And I said, sure, why not? And I went a couple of times and, you know, I was just in that room and that vibe. And, and so I kind of kept in touch with you a little bit here and there and seen you at the seminars and passed by, said hello. And then I was on Instagram and, you know, doing this. And I said, and it said something there about masterminds. And so that was, I think, in 19. So I started watching some of your masterminds and then I received something else about role play. So I said, hey. One of my best years was when I was role playing in, in a group. And so I said, yeah, I'll do it. Sure. And that's kind of how I got hooked up with you, which has been one of the, the, the best things. That, and, and I really appreciate what you do for your agents. And thank you. And, um, you know, sometimes we have to hit the reset button and, you know, you got a good support supporting company. It's incredible what you do for them. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So how is, how is what we're doing helping you? You're not, 
you're not close to any of the offices. You're doing this all virtually, more or less. Um, yet you you show up three, four, five days a week. You uh, you connect up with uh, some of the programming and stuff. But what's your because you shared a little bit of this with me over the last um, few months. That try to take us through this because. You're a 40, 50 deal guy, and you are as consistent as anyone else we have in the company. Right. So why? So, you know, I, you know, I share my dad was in the real estate business and he worked every single weekend uh, doing open. You know, he was a big listing agent, in fact. So every week, you know, and he loved the business. So every weekend we'd be down in L.A. and and I didn't want to do it that way. And so what I did for me is, is I really just wanted to work real estate five days a week. And I really only work five days a week besides answering an email or a text on Saturday and Sunday. I do not like working on the weekends. And I have, you know, I have, it's just, I, it, it, it kind of zaps my energy. So um, I just try to, carp, uh, you know, bring air, create urgency with my appointments and just bring everybody inside of a week and then bring everybody inside of my schedule and always create that uh, urgency so that they follow my schedule and not somebody out and, and I don't follow their schedule. Right. And so for consistently, I've been hitting these numbers. Um, I don't know if you know this, Neil, I have six kids. No, I didn't. From the age of 18 down to nine and same wife, no twins. Um, so it, it's like my, my days really don't stop during the week. So, which is probably why I like my weekends and, uh, I wanted to be part of their, their lives. I wanted to coach their soccer team. I wanted to go to all their soccer games and I probably only missed a, you know, a handful of their soccer games and those are played on the weekends. And so I just made a decision, you know, uh, you know, I may not be, you know, I, sh I should be at 70 and a hundred, you know, and you're kind of, in you, you have inspired me to hit that million dollar mark. Um, just based on some things you said earlier this year. So I appreciate that. Um, but at the same time is uh, I don't want to work to run my life. So I really just focus on doing mo all my business has really been inside of five days. Got it. Got it. So, so you're going to the role play. Uh, you're listening to that. You're listening to the, some of the inspirations. Um, how does that keep you on track? How does that how is that getting into your head? And Trent, we all have, I, I just had this conversation this morning. You know, I, my commitment is to be there at eight o'clock in the morning or, or prospecting at nine o'clock. Life gets in the way. I get a flat tire. I get a phone call. I get a, I get a listing lead, whatever, whatever. You know, and they're not doing 50 transactions a year on average. I mean, you think about this. You've been doing between 40 and 50 transactions a year for 20 years, Miguel. Yeah. So, yeah. And so, you know, the, the setup that you have here on the role play is, you know, I'm the type of person that doesn't like to disappoint. And uh, when you, you invited me to the role play, I said, Hey, listen, this is an opportunity where I can get in here and just role play. And what, what it does several things. I mean, I have like five or six points of what it's done for me. Most importantly, it's gotten me in front of the screen with almost suited up, right? Sometimes I'm scrambling, I don't have my tie on, but I'm here and I'm ready to role play. And it starts my, and it starts that cold engine into, into. And you're, life. you're dressed to go to work. hundred percent. And you're dressed to go to work because why? Because for me, it just, it, that is part of, for me, it's part of the, it's part of the process. Got it. Back in 19 or 20, 2002, you know, I've been with the same company for a long time and I see big agents and they're in shorts and, and this is for me, right? It's not for everybody. I'm not putting anybody down, but I see them in shorts or jeans and whatnot. And there's a time and place for that for me, which is not often when I come into the office, but here's the deal. I went to a dealership down the street in the summer and the guy comes out with a tie on. And I said, gosh, I'm like, you're wearing a tie. It's a hundred and it's a hundred degrees outside. Why aren't professionals dressed to impress? And, and what's interesting is I don't, I always come in ready, ready to play ball because I don't know when a client's going to come in or somebody's coming to talk to a real estate agent. I'm ready. 
And I can't tell you how much money that's made me just being prepared and professional. You know, a lot of my early yeah. business was from walk-ins um, at the Remax yeah. office. So I was always ready to go. So go it's helped me, Neil, just to show up at nine o'clock, right? And then you got this incredible thing called Hot Mike, which I want to encourage anybody who's on this call, maybe to reach out to Neil and even people in your office to get on the hot mic because it stretches you. You're so uncomfortable, but you get comfortable being uncomfortable, right? And I think I mentioned this to you the other day is, you know, again, I don't want to disappoint. That's just how I am. I want to bring value. So when I get on the call, I want to bring value to people who are listening I want to bring value to what I'm doing. I want to learn from what I'm saying. And I take 30 minutes and I try to, and when I'm done, I try to stretch that out to 60 minutes. And I've been able to do that a few times. And a couple of times I've stretched it out to 90 with that level of energy. Right. And so it's helped me help me do that. And also it's helped me close harder. Right. Because again, I got, 30, 40, 50 people looking at me, I'm like, hey, let's let's bring value. Let's see what we we like. call that the show off factor. Absolutely. And and when and it but I don't mean to be mean about it, but we're there's all of us try to show off for, to people all the time. And that's where this came from years ago. And it's it's really very helpful. And you're using it. So the show off factor make you any money? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And here's how, yeah. you know, you're, you're going to move through that lead faster. You're going to ask him tougher questions. You're going to close. Is there a yes? One of the things that I shared with, um, I don't, I don't know if it was you and Robert, but my fear is that I'll accept the first no and accept it and not do anything about it. So the hot mic is actually helped me not accept the first no and keep asking a question. And then I have a little script that I use at the end of that when they do say no. So I'm prepared to, to their no. We have to be prepared for the no. Right. right. We practice the scripts where it's yes, yes, but you gotta be prepared for the no because that's what we get most of. Right. And then try to pivot that conversation into something that, into what you're trying to get from them, right? So it's really helped me out there a ton. Good, yeah. good to hear that, excellent. So, um, you were talking earlier about your business coming a, a lot from past client and sphere. Still, still that way? Yeah, that's, I'm heavy on, on that group of people. How many people in your database? Uh, about 1,100, right at 1,100. Okay. And um, is there a particular uh, CRM that you use uh, over another one or? So not perfect, but I do use uh, Top Producer. And in Top Producer, there's this thing called a uh, real estate coach, I believe. And it props up five contacts to go through and then you refresh it and brings the next five. And why I like that, it's because even in there, sometimes there's people that I haven't spoken to in two years and that's my bad, right? But, you know, again, just being on the hot mic, that's the phone call I got to make. I'm going to just say, hey, I haven't spoken to you in two years. I apologize. Hey, it's been a long time since I've spoken with you, right? We all got clients like that, right? There's all, you know, even during COVID, I thought I got a hold of everybody. I didn't, right? And so I use that CRM and then I always put notes, um, you know, whenever I can about the, the, the um, either subject that I spoke about and or something that's happening in their lives. Yeah, I, I've listened to your calls before, and you, you seem to have really decent notes because you're always bringing something up, a family name. Uh, I heard, you know, did you go on the trip that you said you were going to go on, things like that. So um, it works out well. So you're moving. How many past client sphere calls can, do you make in a, in a given day? Oh, do you have a particular great. goal? Yeah, so um, it, it's something that I'm going to be polishing up a little bit more in terms of the call directive, in terms of how many of this group and that group I'm going to call. Um, I, I realize that in, in the consistency of making phone calls, by showing up to your group, by participating, by getting on the phone, here's the beauty about consistency. Not only does it make you money, 
but it also identifies, and I spoke with Robert about this the other day, it identifies the holes that you have in your business, right? And, and so I have a whole laundry list of the holes that I have in my business. And what I try to do is just, do I delegate that? Can I fix that? Um, so on the average, I'm probably making anywhere from 10 to 13 contacts in the past client center of influence, which sometimes will result in the message, right? Um, I was told not to leave a message, to leave a message. I just <laughs> call. If I can get them, great. If not, I leave a message. They Got hear it. my voice. Got so, it. Yeah. So, Miguel, when you talk about holes in your business, I, I don't want to pass that up. Can you describe for us uh, what a hole in your business might be or what it looks like? A good night's sleep, eating well, starting on time following a call directive, meaning this day I'm calling a past clients. This day I'm doing some online lead follow-up. This day I'm calling the expireds I couldn't get to. I don't do a ton of expireds and, 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 and that's something that I'm tweaking as well. In fact, the next hot mic I do, I'm just going to call expireds because that's going to get me in a very uncomfortable situation, but something that's necessary. I have success with them because I'm very conversational, but I just, you know, sometimes there's just a hang up of the energy and what am I going to say? And, and so, um, but that will also bring my numbers from 50 to 70, in my opinion, because there's only so much business you can do out of the sphere of influence group. Right. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Miguel, you open to take a few questions? Far away. All right. So we're going to open up to the group before I do. Um, and, and this has been great so far. Thank you so much. What do you think your um, your uh, superpower is? What 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 makes you go on a regular basis for 21, 22 years? And looks like you're still going strong. Yeah, I, I really looking at these next ten years as a an incredible opportunity where I live because of all the new development that's coming up. Um, secondly, because I know most of the people here in my community they don't train. There's not a lot of people that train under a system. And so I feel like I have a step up. So I'm really super excited for the next 10 years for several reasons. I've been with Mike Ferry for 22 years. So there's nothing really new I can learn, even though I'm still going to the seminars to learn. Now it's just about implementation, right? And then just surrounding yourself with groups like what you're putting together, what you have for your office, other people in, in, the, in the system. It just, it just kind of is bringing everything together. So okay. one of the... Go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. So, so one of the super, I think one of the superpowers that I have is I genuinely care about people. I want to do the right thing. I want to, you know, sometimes to my detriment, I want to feel that connection and make sure they feel comfortable with what's going on. So um, what I've pulled back on is I just use a little more enthusiasm when I'm, when I'm speaking with people, because in my enthusiasm with the knowledge and skills that I have creates conviction and people want that honesty, they want that conviction, right? Even if they're not thinking that that's what they wanna do, but this guy's telling me. So definitely the energy is important for me and that's when my game is on. Um, and then just be in, and just having that conviction when I speak with them. So definitely, is definitely a strength. Very, very cool. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, let's open it up a little bit here. Um, just speak out or raise your hand if you've got questions for Miguel right now. Let's see who we got. Anyone? Go ahead, Shasha. Shasha, okay, you didn't really. Do you have a question? Did I lose the sound? No, you're, you're still good. Okay, good. So uh, while they're queuing up, uh, Miguel, you there? I'm here. Okay, so while they're queuing up, I, I had one more question I, I wanted to ask you. Um, is there a particular script or dialogue that you use uh, that works really well for you uh, that when something comes up, whether it's a for sale by owner and expired and just listed, just sold something that happens, you know, when that 
that happens, boom, you jump right on it. You have anything like that? Yeah, Neil, this is really important to everybody who's listening. Okay. This is, this has been my, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure that it really just got birth from, from doing, you know, doing these role plays and doing hot mic. Okay. It really birthed this year and 22 years later of being in the business. And when we're making phone calls, we got to expect they're going to say no. And you don't want to accept no as, a, as, as the final answer. And what I do is I, I use this, I, I pivot and I say, well, um, what I say is, is this very important. Well, well, Neil, I, the reason, and this can work at the end of anything that you're saying, the reason I'm calling is the market made hundred thousand dollars over the last six months. Were well, you aware of that? And when this starts happening, five or six homes sell right away. Or it could be the reason I was calling is I have these two properties that are coming up for sale. Or it could be my company has these two properties that just got listed. And it's interesting when somebody says, no, not interested, 40 to 50% of the times they say, wait, tell me about the two bedroom condo. Because my in-laws are going to sell their house up in Palmdale to come down here and they need something that's on the first floor. Right. And so it's, it's, it's incredible. I can use it with my past client set of influence. I can use it for any sign call, follow-up, old Zillow leads, anything. You can use that every single time. Oh, every that's time. great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. So I have, a, I have a question. Go ahead, Robert. Please. You know, so Miguel with, with six kids, and all and the amount of work that you have and all the things going on how do you stay away from distractions and keep yourself on track every single day well um it's it's not easy in fact right while we're doing this interview my daughter's called me three times here right so it's um it's you know the mute button but um i how do i not yeah, it's, I think what, it's a great question. And I think what really drives me, Robert, is there was one year somewhere in that last decade that I was down to like 3000 bucks in my, one of my accounts. And I remember having lunch with this guy and he, and, and I said, I hope, and I had like six, six escrows and they're all closing like in 10 days. And I said, oh my gosh, please let there not be an earthquake or I'll be doomed and such and such. Right. So um, I never let that happen again because I didn't want to let the family down. I didn't want to go to a credit card to make that payment. And so for me, that was just the, the fear and the driving force. Now, you know, we all, what is that called? Debt motivation. Um, I don't go out and buy expensive cars for debt motivation. I have enough debt motivation at home in colleges and wedding. I have five girls and one son. Okay. Five girls. Wow. Yeah. So that, that motivation, that's what keeps me going, bud. I get it. Oh, I get that. That's for sure. That's a great question, Robert. Excellent. Good job. Well, I, I, I bring it up so, and I had a great answer, but I, I brought it up because, you know, we all run into this, myself included, and everyone's guilty of, oh, I got so many distractions and it's, you know, we have maybe a dog or a kid or, you know, things like that. And yet we'll jump to whatever that is. And now imagine six kids, wife, you know, all the other things going on in regular life, a deal, all these deals that you're doing. I mean, you, I imagine he's got every excuse for a distraction to let the day completely get away. And he seems to not do that. And so it's, I was just curious. I get my ups and downs, right? I mean, that's, that's probably why, um, I've been pretty consistent, right? And I kind of hang on under the radar. I'm right there and I work hard and he's got game, but I'm not that, you know, I haven't been up here, right? And so now I got a kid going to college and next year, another one goes to college and the year after that, another one goes to college. So I'm thinking, okay, I, you know, these next 10 years, I better cash in to pay off all that debt plus weddings. Hopefully they'll keep it small. I don't know. So it's not how much you're saving. Somebody told me this, Neil, take, listen to this. Um, it, don't worry about saving money. Worry about how to make more money, right? right. With the kids, right? And I, and I really shook me. I'm like, gosh, that's really good thinking. You know, it's like, if the kids don't get a scholarship, it's okay. Figure out how to make the money. 
right? And so that kind of inspired me. Plus, you, told, you know, something you said earlier this year, which like is, is stretching me so, to a million. Miguel, I have a question for you. Yep. Um, are you, did you tell the children that you're going to pay for college if they get in? Uh, is that what you do in your family? I have not. I, I think it's just kind of, they, they think it is. I, I mean, I, no, I haven't really said anything at all. So no one else listened. I'm just going to have a little conversation with Miguel real quick. Um, many years ago, I have, I have four children. Um, six is more, so clearly. Um, and I also suffer from I don't want to disappoint anyone. I is very, it's built in my core. Okay. So I get it. So what I did, and you might want to consider this is I went to the children and I said, you get into college, you get into the college of your choice and I will write the checks for the bills. Okay. You will not have to pay anything for college. That's on me. And then I sat down and I did the math on what I just committed to, and I committed it to my children. And then every morning I didn't want to get up and do what I was supposed to do. I would have this vision of one of my children running in to myself and my wife saying, dad, dad, I got all the SATs. I got the scores. I did everything I needed to do. And they accepted me into Stanford and I'm excited and waited for the child. Right. And then the child puts out their hand and says, here's a letter. I need $50,000 by Thursday. And I wouldn't have it. Yeah. And I, as a dad, would melt, Miguel. Yeah. I would melt. So when I didn't want to get up and do what I was supposed to do, I would have that vision. So if you want, we can talk more about this another time. I, but I, gar I guarantee you. There is a way to light a fire under the tush. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking about a couple million dollars in college tuitions. That's right. I did that number. It, it did come yeah. out to a couple million. And, yeah. and by the way, there are no small weddings anymore. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because if you do a small wedding, they want the cash. That's right. That's right. <laughs> a small wedding or a down payment on the house. Or the down payment the on the house. Or yeah. both, Miguel. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. Good stuff. So, anyway, good stuff. Good stuff. Good stuff. Other questions of Miguel? Uh, Fred, yeah. did you have your hand up? I did. Um, Miguel, I met you in 2013 at the production retreat. We hit it off. And it was, uh, I believe, just 12 short months later, you said this was the first year that I'm going to break a half a million dollars. Give me, give all of us three keys to your success that you focus on, three keys that you that drive you week in and week out, year in and year out to do what you do. Okay, well, I'll, I'll do the great question, Fred. I appreciate that. Yeah, I remember that day because uh, it's just, it's, it's interesting how we got connected there and we continue to be great friends and hold each other accountable and bounce business ideas. And, and it was, it's actually 2000, I'm looking at my numbers. I'm like, I went from 395,000 to 558. And then 627, and then 600, and then six, you know, and it just went up from there. Uh, and then it went back down, right? Um, the, the key, Fred, is, and you've and I have spoken about it, is, is really, I mean, we work so hard to get that client. And once we get paid, what are we doing with that? Like, how are we, how hard are we working? We work hard for the client. We got to work hard in the, in the transaction, give anticipate the pitfalls. And we had to do a lot of that in 2006 and seven when the market was crashing to set expectations. You know, hey, this thing may not go, to, you know, whatever it was, right? And so I just always focus on giving the best, best service to them possible and getting ahead of their questions. So anytime they called me and we spoke about this before, I say, like, gosh, I keep getting that phone call regarding the home inspection and what happened for the seller, right? Okay, great. Now, our job is to make the phone call before they call us. And so I started kind of playing that game and then the service level just went up and then they enthusiasm and trust and conviction. I, I got their back. And I've also, Fred, the other thing is I've asked clients to pull out of deals. I said, guys, this doesn't work well. I don't feel comfortable with it. 
let's go look for something else, right? Or this buyer doesn't, is not in your best interest. Let's, let's wait for a better offer. And so I'm not afraid of that. Why? Obviously, because if you generate, you don't have to tolerate. If you're always on the phone looking for business, you're going to have it. But most importantly, it's for the client, right? I mean, who wants to close a deal and then have that deal chipping at your heels after it's closed? You don't want anything regarding that deal other than the relationship with the person that you had the transaction with. So I, I, I would leave it right at that, you know, focus on giving the best possible service. Thank you. Great question, Fred. Thanks, Miguel. Good stuff. Other questions for Miguel right now? So a question came in the chat box that for a person who can adapt or move from one personality to another, what kind of accountability partner would you recommend to have? Um, the best accountability partner, Neil and Robert, you might be able to confirm with this, is not just the person that's well scripted and that's, I don't know that that's the best par accountability partner, at least for me, it hasn't been. The best partner has been the one that shows up. The one that shows up. I don't care if you just started a month, but if you're going to show up, I'm game. I'll learn. You learn from me. I'm learning from you. Why? Because even if they're doing more business or less business, we can always learn from what people are doing right and wrong. I, I learned that in the hot script, in the hot mic. I listen to people because I appreciate, you know, who was it? I think it was jo uh, uh, Tess. Tess had incredible energy yesterday. I didn't have it. And I fed off of that. I'm like, God, I really love her energy. I'm like, great job, Tess. Right. And then, and all of a sudden by, by giving that, you know, acknowledgement, all of a sudden it brings it to you. My point is there's always something to learn. Are there, you know, tough questions as I hear people on the phone, I'm like, oh, they're getting long winded. I do that too. Okay. I'm not judging them at all because we're all in this game of life to grow up and get better until the day we die. But I do learn from people because I'm, I, I sometimes have those hangups and I'm like, ah, they're, they're getting into the kids and the stuff and that, and, and they're not really asking what they want to ask. Note to Miguel, ask what you want to ask. Because when you ask what you want to ask, you're living in integrity. And when you live in integrity, people gravitate towards that. And yeah, Miguel's here making a sales phone call. Gosh, darn it. You bet I am. Because I have two listings I just listed. And I want to know if you know anybody that's interested in these listings. And by the way, when do you plan on moving? Right? And so Great that's stuff. Just how I said that stuff. No. Well said. Thank you. Absolutely. Good stuff. All right, everyone. Uh, other questions for Miguel today? Just very fast. This is Jeanette. Hi, Miguel. Hi, Jeanette. Uh, I'm, I appreciate so much seeing you there. I even told my team, listen to this guy. He, he <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. Is good. I, I really appreciate. And I just wonder, when are you going to join to be part of this family? <laughs> well, you know, Neil was talking about build, uh, getting a, uh, a building out here and uh, we were going to have a nice office space here. No, we thank you. Thank you, you for so the much. invite. We appreciate you so much. Yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate Thank it. You and much. you know what? Uh, you know, and I hope everyone that does a hot mic or people on this phone, on this uh, Zoom is is benefiting and, and I can bring some value because I get a lot of value from all of you too. And I think this, you know, I, 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 I You're, you, you muted yourself and this was very important stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know where I left. Tell. I could tell it was really important. <laughs> um, I benefit a lot from this group and I, and I hope that you benefit from me and we could all just, we, we share in this game of life where at the end of the day, you know, it, it's real estate and we have life and that's real life. And we have relationship and relationship issues and we have kids and, you know, drama that happens. And when we can collaborate and work together and just kind of build each other up, there, there's a huge reward. I have this proverb and I think I shared this with Robert. It, it says this, it says the one who gives freely, yet one who gives freely, yet grows the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. And you need to really study that because this is applicable in every part of your life, right? I want to give encouragement. I want to give, um, I want to prospect more. And if I don't, 
guess what? I'm suffering want. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough deals. I'm in a depressed mode. I feel guilty. Why? Because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And so I appreciate you, uh, Jeanette, bringing that up. And, you know, we got to keep encouraging one another and build each other up because we're on the same team here, you know? And anyway, enough there. Stop. <laughs> Thanks, Miguel. Ali, did you have a question? I just want to thank you, Miguel, for being so honest, clearly sharing everything with all these great people. He has put tremendous amount of effort, I believe, based on the system he has been associated with, micro organization. He has built a complete total package, very strong professional approach based on the personal desire and burning desire that he to serve the people a great example of being a wonderful salesperson in this market to do the job to serve the sellers and buyers uh, is a perfect example of being a great salesperson for the rest is professionally for success a great motivation great uh, energy on the phone every day i see every day attends the role play partners and uh, absolutely a great package. I loved it. Good. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Ali. Eric, did you have a question of Miguel? Yes, yeah, it's pretty much the same question I always ask. I just wanted to know um, about your your morning routine, your, your like your, your schedule. Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Eric. And by the way, I just wanted to let you know, I'm, I've been seeing a lot of the, the ties lately and you look dapper, man. You look professional. Uh, your game has just uh, stepped up since at least I've been listening to you. I'm an imitator, imitating, and, um, imitating yeah, the group. I'm just I appreciate imitating. it. And, and he has a two o'clock slot, everybody. So don't mess yeah. with Eric, okay? Don't play with it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been mixing up my morning routine. Sometimes I get like so... Um, excited about waking up in the morning and I'm going to the gym and then I hit the snooze button. Right. But I got to be in here by eight. So, you know, I, I massage that, but you know, this morning I, you know, I, I mix it up a little bit. I have to mix it up because I get bored easy. I have maybe ADD, who knows? Um, but I have to, this morning I went on a, you know, a quick 20 mile bike ride. You know, I was up at five 30, met with some guys. We spun around town, got, got into, to, um, got into the office and, and I actually took my time getting into the office. So for me, it's important to kind of schedule that, that not so rigid schedule, or it's actually really is my schedule, right? Hey, just come in at nine instead of eight, right? And so I, uh, for me, uh, again, it's, you know, sometimes I hit the gym, sometimes I don't, Eric, and you got to see what works for you, bud, okay? Because one of the things that you can, that really damage yourself is you start doing what other people, like, I can't be Neil, I can't be you, because that's not what I desire. So you got to really find out what's important for you. And then don't overkill it, right? I mean, you don't have to do it five days a week. Start small. You know, last year, I don't know if you guys knew, I, I, I rode 6,000 miles on my bike last year, uh, wow. just over 6,000 miles. And how that started is I started with 20 miles. And then I got from 20 to 25 at, on, a, on a given exercise routine. Then I went to 30. Then I went to 40, 50, 60. I jumped to 100. Not all the time. But then I would just like, I reach out for a hundred and stretch myself. I'd come back and do 60. I'd come back. And so all of a sudden 20 miles, like today, I just went 20. That was easy peasy, you know, boom, 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 finish in an hour and a half. Right. The other night I did 30, finish in an hour and a half. That was more intense. Right. So everything's in moderation and, and it's baby steps. A lot of times we want to crush it. The problem with that is that it takes the skill set to crush it right? You got to do a little bit every day to get really great at something. Does that make sense? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Hope I answered the question. Yeah. Uh, great stuff. Excellent. Okay. Everybody, let's unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Give Miguel a big hand. Woo! All right. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Awesome. Great stuff, Miguel. Thank you. Very cool. Woo! Very, very cool. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Miguel, you know the routine. We're going to, you you're welcome to stick around or we're just going to talk about, we're just going to talk about you, basically. Um, uh, okay, what did we learn today? What did we learn from Miguel today? 
I just want to say something. I have that experience. I have three boys. I sent them to college. I purchased them a home, each of them. So don't commit yourself, Miguel, too much for the <laughs> kids. <laughs> you know, don't give them too much. Uh, really give them some motivation to go after some things, you know. When they do all this stuff, they don't care. I have done it. Yeah. Uh, leave right. some homework. Leave some work, homework for themselves. They go after that. Good advice. Um, okay. What hey, else did we learn today? Here, really quick, if you don't mind. Um, just sure. if my wife ever listens to this. How do you do it with six kids? I mean, honestly, my wife is organized. She's an important part of of the of the family. Obviously right? And um, if it wasn't for her, I mean, I'd be picking up a lot of loose ends. So um, she's allowed me the space to do what I do, right? right. So just just want to make sure it doesn't, it's not just one person. A lot of times your better half is involved, even though you can't see them. No, absolutely, Miguel. Uh, you're absolutely right. Good stuff. Okay. What else do we learn today from Miguel? Besides our spouses are very important to us. A happy just, wife is a happy life. But, Good reminder, um, Miguel. Miguel, what I what I noticed from you from here, uh, the interview, I think I noticed more from from the actual being on Zoom. Like yesterday, when you told Tess that you know good energy, it was at I don't know if anybody knows it was at three thirty in the afternoon or three o'clock in the afternoon. You were still prospecting. So my question is, how long do you prospect every day? You know that that that's a great question because. Again, now that there's a lot, you know, these, these, these uh, hot mic thing, I, I found that I wasn't doing as much prospecting in the afternoon as I, as I should be. And so when I plug in and I'm on the camera, it's time to get to work. And so I started thinking about this the other day. I'm wondering if I should schedule eight hours of prospecting and then put blocks of, okay, admin in there. Okay. So it takes a half hour away, put lunch, take some time away. And when I'm not doing something productive, I should be prospecting. Um, Interesting. So, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering. I don't know. But then again, here we go trying to, you know, do so much and, and it's not realistic. So, um, but the afternoon prospecting has helped me bridge the gap, um, get those leads that I haven't been able to do. And, and quite frankly, my, my first hot mic, which was the best prospecting session I had that this year might be up there with one and two was in the afternoon on a Friday, first time hot mic, and I crushed it for, I just, my confidence was there. I learned things about myself. I asked tough questions. I'm, I, be, I, I wasn't scared to ask any more uh, tough questions, right? And it came from that time, Neil, um, and everybody on this call. Well, that's very cool. So how do you quantify this? Would you say the hot mic, you do the hot mic once or twice a week? Yeah, yeah. So you do open mic once or twice a week and it, you get, is it worth a deal a month to you? A deal every other month? What do you well, think? I was, I was going to look at look for you at the Mike Ferry uh, retreat and uh, uh, buy your dinner. And I don't care where it was because it's definitely helped me uh, uh, just get out of my comfort zone. And, you know, I got the confidence. It's just sometimes we, we, we keep the tucked away, right? We all got it in us. Right. It's just a matter of you're willing to ask that bold question that's keeping you from building your confidence. Like, you know, if you were to move, where do you think you would go next? Right. Right. That question. Right. That that was a tough one earlier this year. I don't know why. And I've said it 100 times before. And boom, I said it. They opened up and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I made it tougher than what it really was. Just have a conversation. Right. So, yeah, Neil, I probably um, two, three deals. Somewhere around in there, you know, for you. Deal. Extra, yeah. Closes, hard Good. closes, more urgency. So another thirty, forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Wow. The year's not even over. And just just think if you did it a little more often. Yeah. Yeah. I try to jump on three times a week. It's been like two. And um, you know, when my energy's not there, I, I don't want to bring that to the group. But again, maybe sometimes that'll help me, you know, lift up my energy. Try that because I'll bet you it does. Yeah. So if you don't feel like it, do it anyway. Yeah, there we yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. Good. All right. Other questions? Uh, excuse me. What else did we learn from Miguel? These are great. 
Go ahead, Robert. So Miguel, greatly appreciate everything that you do here at the, the, the virtual office and your energy, your enthusiasm. You know, I had a few things written down, but the last thing you actually just said might be the winner. But the first thing I wrote down here that I was going to share was you talked about customer service and you said, call them before they call you. And I think that's something that a lot of people miss in customer service is that we're more reactive than proactive, especially when things are going bad. And so I love that line of call them before they call you. But I got to tell you what you just said, schedule eight hours of prospecting a day. And, may, and I, I don't know if maybe I added to this, maybe you, this is not even what you meant. But schedule eight hours of prospecting a day and then take out, okay, well, 30 minutes for role play, hour for lunch, 30 minutes admin. And that way your mindset is such that if you're not doing something else, you're prospecting. Right. So instead of just saying, oh, I got to prospect three hours a day. No, it's eight hours and then subtract from that. That is, a, I, I, yeah, that is I, there is something. It's, it's interesting what you think about in the shower in the morning when your mind is clear, right? <laughs> Um, that we're often getting ready this week, but uh, I, I might play around for it, play around with it in uh, in uh, July, you know, and just see how that works, you know. Try it for a week, you know. Try it for a day, you know. Start that was small. Great. Yeah, that was very. That was great. Good stuff. Excellent. All right, unmute yourselves. Let's give Miguel a big hand. Woo! All right. Hey, Miguel. Okay. Appreciate it. Good job. Hey, Miguel, do you have open mic the rest of the afternoon or you're not on? I'm, I'm on. I have uh, two appointments today, so I appreciate it, but I'll catch everyone in the morning. All right. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you again. Really, really good job. Yeah. Thank you. Neil, All what right. was your big takeaway? You know, I know the show off factor is powerful. I used it, I've used it for years with um, agents when I was coaching professionally for Mike Ferry. Uh, we'd use it all the time. That's where I developed it. And we use it here, but sometimes, sometimes I don't think we, um, we make all the connections. And it's like, it's, it's like use it uh, to benefit ourselves for a 30 minute period. And you know, essentially, kind of what I think Miguel's doing on a regular basis is he's uh, supercharging, supercharging his prospecting because he might take an hour, an hour and a half if he wasn't on open mic to get similar results and he's compressing it and supercharging it into a 30, 60 minute period and getting far more results because his tonality is good, his focus is good, his intention is good, his intensity is good and his energy is good. You get more out of less. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Let's let's all try it. Yeah. So my my suspicion here, Robert, is that you're going to have to expand open mic into the early evening now. <laughs> I love it. Hey guys, thanks, Neil. I'm gonna. I have to get. All right, ready. Miguel. Thank you. I mean, very we, cool. We, we Good can stuff. do that. That's fine. Well, we'll we'll see what we'll see what next week brings or tomorrow, well, whichever Neil, comes first. Question, there was a question in the chat box though of what is open mic or hot mic. So I don't know if you want to explain that. Um, well, thank you. The the simplest thing for those that that don't know that might be on here is that from nine to noon, uh, Monday through Friday, we as a group come on to this virtual channel and everyone's muted and they're prospecting their past client, their sphere just listed expires, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe some of the scripts that we practiced earlier and they're doing their prospecting and one person is signed up for what we call open mic and you can hear them prospect for that 30 minutes. Um, so two things happens. A, the people listening, the 30, 40 people that are listening are learning. 
and the person who's doing the prospecting has 30, 40, 50 people's eyes, 80 eyes on them and ears on them, and they're listening to the intensity and crank it up, and they're getting more results. And um, does that help, Robert? Does that help explain it? Explains it to me. Okay. That's what I would do.